afternoon, everyone. My name is Caitlin Lutz, and today we'll be discussing calving considerations. I'd like to thank my colleagues, Rob Lynch and Margaret Klausdorf, for their assistance in putting this presentation together. And then we'll be discussing the behavior and physiology surrounding calving and labor and dairy cattle, as well as the pointers on calving assistance and um, some tips and tricks surrounding difficult births. So first we'll go into the three stages of labor that we see in cattle. Stage one is defined by dilation of the cervix and positioning of the fetus into the correct position for birth. So on the left here, you can see a series of photos showing behaviors that we see in cattle in stage one. Stage one of labor, generally lasts between two and 24 hours. So it's very variable with heifers spending more time in stage one than cows. Sometimes we'll miss all signs of stage one, especially in cows because signs progress very quickly and signs can be quite subtle. So on the left-hand side of this diagram, we'll see that in the beginning of stage one, cows seek isolation. So Lindsay Ferlito discussed this um, more in depth in last week's discussion on facilities. So we won't go further into this. Feed intake and um, water intake also decrease during this time. And as stage one progresses, you'll see more restless behavior. So cows going up and down, increased bouts of lying down, tail being raised. Um, and if you have rumination monitoring, you can also see a decrease in rumination. As stage one continues, we see um, more time in lateral recumbency, so laying on their side, licking at the ground, sniffing around the maternity pen, and increased attention to the abdomen as those um, uterine contractions increase. If you look more closely, you'll see elongation of the vulva and swelling of the vulva, as well as mucus discharge, nice clear mucus discharge. You also see relaxation around the tail head, um, and uh, relaxation of those pelvic ligaments. So the physiology at this time, the fetus is the one in cattle who initiates the birthing process. So the fetus releases cortisol and that starts a cascade of events which causes an increase in estrogen and a decrease in progesterone. So progesterone is the hormone that has been um, maintaining the pregnancy for the last nine and a half months. As that starts to decrease, we um, get increase in estrogen, increase in uterine contractility, uterine contractions, uh, a relaxation of the ligaments in the pelvis, um, and increased secretion in the birth canal to aid in a normal birth. So stage one ends when the cervix is fully dilated. That allows for the amniotic sac um, or the water bag to be present at the lips of the vulva. So stage two starts with either that water bag breaking or its appearance at the vulva, as you can see in this picture to the left. Stage two ends with the calf being born. So stage two lasts up to two hours in cows and up to three hours in heifers. However, usually uh, as the birth is normal, that will be a much shorter time. So, um, about half an hour in cows up to uh, an hour in heifers is more commonly seen. The physiology at this stage, so we have a calf that's engaged in the cervix and putting pressure on the cervix with its face, with its nose. That conical shape to the face really starts to dilate the cervix. That pressure causes increase in release of oxytocin and prostaglandin into the system, which aids in increasing uterine contractions. And that's a cyclical effect. So that keeps um, occurring, pushing the fetus further into the cervix and causing more oxytocin and prostaglandin release. Stage three is simply the passage of the fetal membranes. Majority of cows will pass their fetal membranes within three hours. If they have a normal functioning immune system, um, white blood cells will um, be sent to the site of attachment of the placenta to the uterus, and that is what aids in breakdown of the connection and release of the placenta. 
Retain placentas, there are many risk factors for a placenta to be retained, um, such as listed here. So now that we know what normal looks like, let's talk about indications for calving assistance. So when should we do an exam, a vaginal exam? The first point is that we don't know the timing of labor unless we write it down. So it's very important to have some sort of record system, whether it be a whiteboard or a notepad um, that's available at the maternity pen and can be communicated between various employees. So during stage one labor, if we don't see progress within four hours, and the start of that restless behavior, tail raising, mucus discharge, et cetera, the cow should be examined. In stage two, if we see no progress within 20 to 30 minutes, that's an indication to do an exam. What we mean by no progress is someone walks by the maternity pen, writes down that they see two feet at the vulva um, at 12 p.m. At 12.30, the next person um, goes by the maternity pen and sees that that calf has its nose visible at the vulva along with two feet. That indicates that progress is occurring every 30 minutes. The other indications for vaginal exam would be um, thinking that the calf is in an incorrect position. So if we see a head but no feet, we see only one foot, we see only a tail, those are indications that the calf is not in the correct position. Lastly, abnormal discharge. So any discolored or foul smelling discharge um, or discharge that includes um, a lot of blood would be indications for a vaginal exam. So once we're ready to do a vaginal exam, what do we need? So first we need to restrain the cow. Um, cows have increased stress levels at this time and can become more aggressive. So it's very important for our safety as well as theirs that we restrain them um, either with a halter or a headlock. If you do put an animal in a headlock, it's important to know that they are likely going to go down at some point um, during the assistance if you do have to um, assist with delivery. And therefore, the headlock must be one that you can quick release the cow from. If not, you should really back them out of the headlock before attempting to deliver a calf. Other things in your calving toolkit. So here we see a bucket to put warm water, soap to clean off the vulva, lubricant, obstetrical lubricant is necessary. It's um, not appropriate to use disinfectants such as betadine or chlorhexidine scrub as lubricant because when used um, without dilution in the vagina and the reproductive tract, it can be very irritating. Lastly, there's a cup just to wash off um, and rinse off the vulva. Gloves are necessary, plenty of clean gloves, as well as um, tools to assist in, in the birth and pulling of a calf. So here we have chains, handles, and a head snare. Don't see a head snare very often on farms, but they are very useful tools um, when we have a head in an abnormal position. It's very important to note that all of this equipment needs to be thoroughly disinfected after each calving and then let to dry. So now that we have our toolkit, what are we going to do for a vaginal exam? What are the steps? So the three golden rules are cleanliness, lubrication, and compassion. So if you remember nothing else from this presentation, those are very important. So cleanliness and lubrication. When we're preparing for the exam, we want to tail, tie the tail out of the way. So here's a picture of um, a tail tied with four loops. It's then brought over her back and tied to her elbow. We want to tie um, her tail to herself rather than to a gate. In case she gets loose or goes down, um, that could damage the tail. The tail is really dirty as well and difficult to clean, and that's why we move it out of the way for um, an exam. Then we want to scrub the entire back end of the cow, make sure everything is really clean, put on a fresh glove and lubricate all up and down the arm. When you enter in for a vaginal exam, we want to think about three things. Is the cervix dilated? 
has the water broken or, and is the calf in a normal position? If the cervix is dilating normally, if the um, water may or may not have broken, and if the calf is presented normally, so things are going normally, we don't have to proceed any further. You can let that cow continue um, to proceed through labor on her own and just continue to monitor her. One thing that causes is some abnormalities um, on the vaginal exam would be a uterine torsion. So this is a common um, call to veterinarians. When you see a cow that's progressing in stage one labor and then she stops showing any signs of labor and you go in for a vaginal exam, you'll feel a very tightly twisted cervix and the vagina will twist as well. You may or may not be able to feel the calf. This can indicate a uterine torsion. And in that case, you would need to um, ask for assistance from someone with more experience to confirm that diagnosis and assist in correcting the problem. So this is normal presentation with a head and two front feet. What I wanna point out here is that if we are assisting with a normal calving, there is no rush to get the calf out quickly. We need to really dilate very well the whole birth canal and lubricate and take our time. Some people are worried that the calf may not be able to breathe when they start pulling, but the umbilical cord that you see here is providing oxygen to the calf until it breaks. At the point that it breaks, the calf's head will be outside um, in the air and will, she'll be able to breathe upon birth. So abnormal presentations, there are many, as you can see in this picture to the right. So keep these in mind during vaginal exams. Um, the picture on the left shows a calf that's being presented posterior or backwards. This is technically normal, but I want to put up, uh, I want to point out one thing that the umbilical cord here, as you can see circled, when you start to pull on the calf, that umbilical cord is going to press on the pelvis, on the pelvic bone of the cow. And when that gets cut off, the oxygen supply to the calf will get cut off. That causes the calf to, um, it stimulates the calf to breathe, but the calf's head is still within the uterus, which is fluid filled. So that is a, um, a risk for aspiration or the calf inhaling uterine fluid. So when you are delivering a backwards calf, it's important to make sure that the entire birth canal is completely dilated and very well lubricated prior to pulling. Because when you start to pull this calf, and that umbilical cord starts to compress, you need to pull more quickly than you do in a forwards calving to prevent aspiration. Also, if you do, are not able to determine the presentation of the calf, it's not a good idea to pull. Instead, it's important to get help because if you pull a calf in abnormal position, this can cause damage to the calf and the cow. When you do pull with chains or ropes, always put two loops around the calf's fetlocks, that lower joint. This disperses tension across the joint. If we just have one loop and it's a very difficult pull, it can result in fracture of the limb, as you can see in this x-ray to the right. We also wanna determine if we can pull the calf vaginally safely. So is the calf small enough to pull vaginally? We'll know this if we pull the head into the into um, the pelvis, the, the head is able to engage within the pelvis and both front feet are out a hand's width breadth beyond the fetlocks. So between the vulva and the fetlock, as you see in this picture, you can fit your hand's breadth. That means that the shoulders have passed through the pelvis and that's the widest part of the calf. If you're delivering a calf backwards, this when you get both hocks beyond the vulva, you know that you can deliver that calf vaginally. So some other um, tips to remember when you're calving, we'll start here in the middle. Never put a loop around the lower jaw of the calf to pull the head around. That is dangerous and can cause trauma to the jaw of the calf. Use a head snare that we showed in the calving toolkit. Over here, we're showing how to prevent hip lock. So 
Um, once you have the front end of the calf um, just at the vulva, you want to rotate the calf 90 degrees so that it's coming out sideways and that will align the widest part of the calf's hips with the widest opening of the cow's uh, pelvis. In the lower corner here, we see um, two ways to pull the front feet when a calf is coming forwards. If you pull both feet at the same time, you have a very wide breadth to the shoulders and it's much more difficult. If you pull one leg and then the other, you are walking the shoulders through the cow's pelvis and that leads to a much easier delivery. Now we're going to look at a video of how to determine if you have a front leg or a back leg of a calf, as this can be quite difficult when you're inside um, the birth canal to determine. So in this video, Dr. Smith is showing the front knee, the carpus bending, and it's bending in the same direction as the fetlock, which is the lower joint there. So on the front leg, both joints bend in the same direction. Now he's showing that the elbow can feel very much like the hock, which is the joint that he's touching on the back leg. On the back leg, the hock bends in the opposite direction of the fetlock. So the fetlock is the joint that he's holding in his right hand and pointing out now. So the back leg, the hock and the fetlock bend in opposite directions, as you can see here. When we're ready to pull the calf, we want to remember a few key points. So lubrication, the second golden rule, very important. So make sure there's plenty of lubrication all the way back to the calf's shoulders as far as you can reach. Pull in an arc, don't pull directly perpendicular to the cow, pull in a natural arc as seen in this picture. Once the calf is in the correct position, allow the cow to lie down. It's much easier for her to use her abdominal force if she's lying down. If she lies down on her right side, it's even better because the rumen weight on the calf actually helps to um, align the calf and pull the calf out more easily. Also, do not constantly provide tension on the chain's rest between her abdominal contractions. If you need more assistance, there are a few options, but when using mechanical assistance, remember the last golden rule, which is compassion. So calf jacks, such as shown in the left picture there, are very useful tools, but also very dangerous tools. They provide 10 times the force of one person, so you can damage a cow quite quickly. There's another system, the pulley system, which can be used that is a bit more gentle on our animals, and you'll see it shown here by Dr. Brenda Carter in a short video. So for demonstration purposes, we just have our chain attached to a gate, obviously. If you are delivering a calf, these would be attached to the calf's feet. I'm going to take my rope and tie it off to my first handle. And then I'm going to go back to my post. And now I can pull, I can work. The other reason that I like this system is that it allows me to work with the cow. As she relaxes, I can relax tension and let things slide. 
slide back in a little bit to prevent tearing. And then when she gives a good abdominal push, I can apply more tension, pull up on the slack, and push down. Now we'll just go over dystocias. So difficult births or dystocias have variable causes. They can be caused by the cow or by the calf. Some of the maternal causes would be uterine inertia. So this is anything that causes the uterus to not be able to contract, whether it be um, milk fever or a, um, the cow for some reason is excessively tired from a long labor, maybe labor stopped because she was stressed. This can lead to uterine inertia. An abnormal birth canal, such as a fractured pelvis, um, and then a large uh, callus forms within the pelvic canal. That's one example. Fetal causes, so abnormal presentation, like we talked about, fetal oversize, um, and lastly, fetal monsters, so fetuses with six legs, two heads, things like that. Some risk factors to dystocia, there are many um, environmental risk factors, such as Again, Lindsay talked about last week, um, having the maternity pen set up to decrease stress, nutritional factors, infectious factors, et cetera. So there've been a few studies looking at the incidence of dystocia. How often do we find them? And I just wanted to point out here that cows have a lower um, risk of dystocia than heifers do. So um, the range that is reported in the literature is from about, uh, in heifers, about 22% to 51% of the time having a dystocia, and cows is much lower, about 22 to 29% of the time. This will vary greatly by farm and management system. So post-calving care. For cows, every farm generally has a dystocia protocol. Um, that's very important. So it can be very variable, and I would encourage you to look at your farm's dystocia protocol or develop one. So calcium is uh, commonly given on many of our dairies post-calving. Some of the most more recent research out of Cornell would indicate that um, avoiding blanket oral calcium therapy is better. So uh, targeting animals such as um, elevated cows with elevated body condition score, later lactation animals um, with calcium supplementation um, is a uh, better targeted treatment uh, protocol than blanket treatment. But this again will be farm dependent. Anti-inflammatories are often um, indicated during a difficult calving. Um, there's some really uh, recent research out of Penn State University um, where they gave two doses of aspirin within 20 or 24 hours apart after calving. And this was to all cows who had calved, not just pistochias. And they found a decrease um, in prevalence of clinical mastitis or cl clinical metritis, uterine infection, and endometritis in those animals who received aspirin. Um, antibiotics may also be indicated depending on the um, degree of assistance. For the calf, directly after birth, the calf should be um, placed in sternal recumbency, so sitting up on their chest. They can breathe much more easily this way than if they're laying on their side. They should also be rubbed vigorously with towels to um, dry off, and um, if they are not breathing well, they should be stimulated to breathe um, by um, irritating their nasal mucosa, so sticking a piece of straw up their nose is one good example that works well. Lastly, we want to write down everything that occurred during that calving. So the cow's ID, the time that birth occurred, whether we had a heifer, bull, or twins, um, and also calving score. So whether the calving was normal, which would be a score one, or very abnormal, ending in a score five, which indicates a C-section. So the take home points here, know what normal is, know what behaviors to observe, monitor the maternity pen frequently. So every half an hour to 45 minutes is what we commonly see on dairies and communicate between shifts. The golden rules, cleanliness, lubrication, and compassion, always keep that in mind when assisting with the calving and only pull a calf if it's in the normal presentation. Record your observations, which 
um, really helps to increase communication and always write down your calving details. With that, I thank you for your time and look forward to answering any questions.